Okay, great. What's the signal? I just went like this. Okay. I could do a bird, a bird call. <laughs> I was hoping you could, <laughs> I was like dying camel or something like that would be good. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so let me just... Just do a call. <laughs> okay, interview number 10, the Shiznit. Okay, well, it's a, a pleasure to meet you. Nice um, to meet obviously. you. Um, I guess, first of all, uh, how does it feel? Uh, does it feel like the end of an era for you at the moment? The, the end of the trilogy? Uh, it does, but in a very nice way. I feel like sort of... I saw Simon the other night because we did a Q&A and we had sort of dinner and it just felt very sort of like... Uh, there's just sort of no sadness or like sort of... or regret... No, I said I did a Jonathan Ross thing. So I did a sort of... Regret. <laughs> We're Apologies bad. to Jonathan. <laughs> I did a regret. It's strange, very strange. I was channeling sort of Wassy for a second. <laughs> um, but uh, I know. I, I think just satisfaction that we actually kind of made good on our promise. Right. Because we wanted to make a third film. We sort of said we would, but we also wanted to make it for ourselves mm. as much as you know answering any fan demand. But so, but so it was very nice to make the movie and 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 be really proud of it as well. So it was something that we you know all three of the movies are very personal and this one maybe more obviously than the other two so it's great to kind of like get a chance to do it mm -hmm. i have to say i think that uh, the film um of all the all three of them is probably the one that struck the most personal chord with me um definitely something that you know i did with my mates uh, and getting to the age now where you can't quite pull that off anymore with the pop calls um was that something that was always you always had that idea in mind um to make that film with simon or did that come later after you made Sean and Hot Fuzz. Yeah, yeah, it came later, the idea. <clears throat> but it was sort of inspired by the events involving all of us. Like, I had done a pub crawl that was, like, uh, incomplete <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> when I was 18. I think I got through even less than the characters in the film. I think maybe they get through nine of the 12. I got through six. <laughs> so it always, like, gnawed, gnawed at me that I was not the kind of prestigious drinker that I thought I was. <laughs> And then later, I had a, written a script about it, which I never produced, uh, when I was 21, called Crawl, that was just about teenagers drinking. Right. And then in my late 20s, me, Simon, and Nick went on a road trip, and we stayed a night in my hometown. Then we attempted it again. And this time, um, it was even worse. I thought it was like four pubs or something. <laughs> So I think that, that, that they they thought that I was like sort of uh, unduly obsessed by this quest, which I was, and so I think that idea of like how like sort of tragic it was to try and recreate like a teenage like um, night of madness as an adult was what became the movie. So um, you said before about the uh, sort of fan expectations. Um, how much of that do you think? brought about this film I mean it kind of feels like it's the end of a trilogy but that's almost because the fans demanded a trilogy um, do you see it as rounding that part of your career off or? I, I guess so I mean but I think we when we had the idea for the story we also realised that there were thematic elements that could link them all together right. so they didn't need to be a trilogy in terms of they are the same characters mm. but they all have like things that carry across they're all films where an individual faces a collective and the collective represents something different in each movie. Mm. Um, they're all kind of films about growing up and they all got... And, and also about the dangers of perpetual adolescence. And so, you know, that's what's... Um, so we, we tried to make something that felt like a closer in terms of, like, it literally ends with um, the, you know, yeah. the world ending. So, um, so yeah, I... I but I think we, it was as much for us as as the fans, you know. So sort of. I think the key is you've got to make films that you want to do rather than you think you ought to do. So uh, again, dealing with fans, I feel you know you've you've satisfied them now with with bringing the trilogy to a close. Um, presumably, you're not writing off working with Simon Pegg and Nick Frost again in the future. And no, that I'd, sort of I'd love to. If we ha once we have the right idea, I hope we'd write it. Yeah. So then you have a quadrilogy. And then a but I don't think it would be part of this series. I think we kind of right. make Sorry, bring this series to a close and then maybe do something else. Do you have? Um, I mean, it still feels so strange to be talking about this like it's all over now, the trilogy. But do you have like a, a favorite line or scene from all three films, or something that stands out to you as like a favorite moment? Um, in okay, so in Shaun of the Dead, let's say. Um, 
the bit in the garden where Ed winds his fun camera on. Oh, it's like sort of one of my fa- in Hot Fuzz, uh, when Simon kicks the old lady in the face. Can't, can't <laughs> go wrong. Can't go wrong with a granny being kicked. And in this one, there's sort of several bits that I love. I love watching the fight scenes. I get mm. like, never tired of watching that. But um, there's something even when I was editing. There's like it's usually like little things that kind of like that make you giggle. Um, so there's a line that Pierce Brosnan says in this that makes me laugh every time. It's because his, his line reading is so funny. And it's when he says to Eddie Miles, and he goes, No, Peter, of course I'm not a robot. <laughs> it just makes me laugh so much. And maybe around that point as well, there's also, uh, like, um, Eddie Miles and like, drunk acting is so epic. Mm. There's a bit in the same scene where he falls asleep and wakes up and briefly <laughs> forgets where he is. <laughs> and that was something that I didn't tell him to do. He just did it and it made me laugh so much. Uh, you mentioned the fight scenes there. Obviously, they, uh, they were so much fun to watch. I Obviously, very technically difficult to accomplish. Um, did you watch the making of on the Blu-ray of back then? I haven't seen the Blu-ray yet. I need to, oh. I need to try and steal one on the way out. But, um, uh, yeah, so I, they, I'm presuming that they were very difficult to accomplish and to choreograph and yeah but the fact that they work at all is a testament to the fact that the lead actors really worked hard and they could really pull off the fighting and the choreography because I think the reason that maybe they look quite striking is because they never really cut away from the action right yeah. you stay yeah. on the actors all the way through and so it creates a slightly different experience to you know it's more more in the line of those kind of Hong Kong films where you stay on Jackie Chan because Jackie Chan can do it, yeah, you know? Yeah. And in this, like, in the fights, if you notice, the camera never really cuts away that much from the actors because they are they, doing all the choreography. And the blanks, as per their name, are not as important. Sure. The blanks are deliberately and, like, an anonymous, yeah. like, sort of wave. So it's 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 really, in a way, like, like fight scenes are like dance numbers. And if you, if you watch, like, all of the actors have slightly different fighting styles. Mm you know, based on what they could actually physically do. So it's kind of a good thing as like the stunt team do a sort of evaluation with each actor and they say, well, Paddy's good at like boxing. Let's give him lots of haymakers. You know, <laughs> Martin's good at sort of the evasive tactics. Let's give him that. You know, Nick was amazing. He come from doing this uh, salsa Cube, film, Cuban, Cuban Fury, Fury yeah. which he finished filming just before this. Right. So he came like sort of, so he was really good at like sort of just the <laughs> dancing, moves, you know, yeah. dancing, you know. So it was great. So I think it's like the, uh, it's a lot of hard work went into it, mm. but it wouldn't have worked at all if the actors weren't as great as they were. Did you, um, so that was obviously a very, um, you know, difficult, probably the, the, I would say maybe the, the most te- technically difficult part of the film perhaps. Uh, maybe Nothing I is d- more difficult than the English weather. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is more difficult than shooting like nights, <laughs> like in the UK. Oh, just something because obviously coming off the back of Scott Pilgrim, and you've got Ant Man coming up next. It was this almost like uh, otherwise a bit of a rest for you, like you know, surrounded by old mates again. And no, no it was, was it the most. Really di- it's probably the most difficult of the four movies. Really? Yeah. Because we shot it in twelve weeks. Like so, Scott Pilgrim was like five and a half months, and this was yeah. three months. And this is not like sort of unambitious in terms of effects and like uh you know scenes with extras and right you know and we ended with some of the most complicated scenes we sort of ended i think the last month of the shoot was all night shoots and then we finished in the sort of catacombs location which was four stories underground so it was a tough shoot you know (laughs) So yeah, I would not call it like so. I'll, I'll never refer to it as a rest. Okay, fair enough. That was that was just me. Then obviously clearly. Um, okay, so uh, just before we uh, we finish up, then um, I've got because obviously the film is the world's end, uh, the end of the world. I just wanted to do a sort of a quick fire round to see how you cope in sort of. It's almost like an apocalypse test. So okay. um, what do you, you know? Uh, testing your skills as to how well you'll be able to. Uh, I'll be cope dead in, in all of them. Go for it. Okay, so it's just quick fire questions. So first of all, um, do you own a gun? No. Um, do you own a panic room or bunker at home? Um, I have I have rooms that I could make into a panic room. Yes. Right. Okay. So that's, that's I'll put that as a yes. <laughs> um, hazmat suit. No. Are you any good at camping? No. Terrible. No. Dead. Dead already. Do you know how to make a fire? No. <laughs> Maybe I did it once when I was eight, but I've forgotten. Can you fire a crossbow? I've never done it. Love to. 
I'd love to try them. Maybe, and then maybe. <laughs> Would you be willing to eat another person? Um, it depends how hungry I was. So if I was very, very hungry, that's and def- they that's weren't going to yes be. Already. So I think it's a yes in the if they weren't if there was nobody around to be offended. <laughs> You're worried about being If polite. it's just me and uh, like, if I'm the only man on earth, who's going to know? Yeah. I'll okay. eat them. Not the other person, clearly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and can you hunt food? Um, like ne- a rabbit? N- never tried. I think you've got like two, two yeses out of like 10 questions. What's bad that's, is that I sort of really like, I, you know, uh, that I would resort to cannibalism so quickly. <laughs> yeah. Because you know I can't make a fire. Make a fire. <laughs> I cannot like shoot a rabbit. I'd be screwed. So I'm, I'm going to just turn into a like, cowardly cannibal almost immediately. Yeah, I think you've, you've failed my completely arbitrary test that means nothing. But um, Don't be yeah, stranded anyway. in like sort of in the Andes with me. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Thanks for your funny. time. Cheers.